Welcome to the second installment, Becoming a Malware Analyst. I am Scott Nussbaum, and I'm a Principal Incident Response and Security Consultant with TrustedSec. Today we'll be focusing on PowerShell obfuscation, shellcode, Metasploit payloads, and tools to help identify common Metasploit function hashes. Before we begin, I would like to extend a thank you to the people who have provided feedback on our previous installment. To reiterate, feedback is always welcome and encouraged. If you happen to have a topic a suggestion for future videos, please reach out. Before we get started analyzing the PowerShell sample, let's go into a little bit about it. This sample was identified by one of our analysts during an actual IR. He found it in the PowerShell event logs. A quick review of the PowerShell command indicated that it was suspicious and needed further review. The determination was based on the Base64 encoding and the length of the Base64 encoded string. This is not a guaranteed indicator of a malicious content, but it's a good indicator that it might need further review. And the further review of it actually doesn't take too much time and can be automated. To start the analysis, I always like to run a couple different commands. I like to run file on it. I like to run ls to get the full like length size of it. MD5 sum, this I will use if I want to look up in like virus totals or do a search of the web to try and determine if anybody else has seen such a sample. And again, I, for PowerShell, it's kind of different. Um, I like to do it on all files that are given, plus it gives me a record of this. I also like to run a SHA-256 on the sample. Normally these outputs I'll pipe to a file for further record, but for now I'm just going to send them to the screen so that we can look at them. After this is done, we see that it is an assembly or an ASCII file. Uh, we see the length of it is uh, 5,833 bytes, and then we get the MD5 and the SHA-256 hashes. Looking at the file itself, we see some of the things that we expect. We see the PowerShell command, followed by the no-op and the hidden. And interesting, we see the encoded command which is basically telling us that it's going to decode the next string, which is a base64 encoded. So what I like to do with this is I always copy things to a different file. In this case, I'll call it SO1B64, since it's a, uh, going to be a base64 string. I will then remove anything that's not part of the base64 string, which is basically just the first part up to the encoded command, save this, cat the newly created file, pipe it to base64-d, redirect that output to so2.ps1 uh, since we know it's going to be a PowerShell script. I'll open it up inside an editor again. And then from this we can see that there's some content in here, then there's a lot of caret slash um, at signs. Uh, this normally is an indication that it's like UTF-16. Another way to look at that is through like the XXD, how we can see every other byte is zero, zero. So to remove the, uh, to convert this from UTF-16 to UTF-8, I like to use iconv, I-C-O-N-V, dash F, UTF-16, LE telling you what you're converting it from, dash T to what format we want to convert it to, UTF-8, SO2 being the file that we want to convert, dash O telling where we want to convert it to, and again this PS1. Now looking at it, it's a lot cleaner and easier to read. Now looking at this, we see that there is Base64 encoded in here based off of these, this string right here, the Base64 uh, string. This object is decoded and stored into S. S, as we can see here at the bottom, is run through a gzip decompression stored in memory and then executed with the IEX as PowerShell. So similar to the others, we will create a new file. It's called so4.b64, since we're going to be taking the base64 value out of this. And 
and we're going to copy only the base64 values. So now we're back. We have the base64 inside SO4. We're going to CAD SO4 again, pipe it to base64-d, redirect that to SO5.ps1.gz. Because as we mentioned earlier, it was uh, gzip compressed and it contained a PowerShell. If we do a file on SO5, it does come back saying that it is a gzip compressed. We'll run gzip-d to decompress it. We'll run a file on the outcome file of that. Now it says that it's ASCII text and with very long lines. Opening this up inside the editor, we do and see that it is PowerShell. These lines right here at the top, they're normally used to inject the shell code into a running process. Um, for the sake of this video, we're not going to get into these on how they do it. We're going to focus on these lines right here. These lines contain a base64 encoded shellcode string and how it's obfuscated. As we can see with the XOR35 here, that each character is XORed by the value 35. The items at the bottom here show the, the ways that this is launched. So SO6.b64 is the new file that we are going to create. We're going to copy the base64 string over and remove anything that's not part of that base64 string. We're going to CAD SO6, pipe it to the base64, dash D, SO7.XOR. Since we already know that this is going to be an XOR value, uh, we'll just name the file extension XOR so that we know it. And if we show out the bytes of it, we can see that quickly there's not much in here that we can actually look at or is human readable. So we'll run this through a, a simple XOR program. Uh, I tend to end up writing one each time since it's simple, but here's one that's already been created. It takes an input file, an output file name from the command line. It will read uh, all contents from the input file. And for each character inside that contents, it will XOR it by 35 and save it out to the ret buffer. Then the um, output file is opened and that ret buffer is written to it. With this, I'm using Python 2.7. Python uh, 3 uses slightly different byte manipulations, so this quick script program works for Python 2.7. I'm going to be saving this to so8.sc, sc for shellcode. And at the bottom of this, we can see that there is some human readable code in here or the strings in here, pipe under uh, slash status under 444. So this lets us know that we're on the right track. And just to clarify, um, what I'll normally do with the namings, if I don't know what the next step is going to be, so like the file name in this uh, case from the XOR, I named it SO8.SC, saying it was shellcode. It's a good uh, guess that it will be shellcode, but if I don't know and I'm uncertain, I'll just name it .bin. And then when I look at the output, I'll run file on each of them, and then I'll open it inside an editor. And once I know what it is, then I'll rename it. So in this case, we have so8.sc, which will show us uh, the pipe status under 444. At this point, we can take it and move it, or load it up inside Ida Pro. We could load it up inside Ghidra. We could also um, use um, a couple other, like Hopper, um, just to look at or uh, to disassemble it. Um, for something this small, I always like to end up using uh, OBJ dump. And if it's more complex than I thought it would be, or if I need to do more with it, then I'll load it back up into Ghidra. But OBJ dump gives me a nice uh, starting point. I always like to do dash binary, dash b space binary. This tells it to ignore the um, headers to the file and just process the first byte as being assembly code dash m i386 
This is telling it what type of uh, chip architecture to uh, disassemble it as. In this case, 32-bit Intel. Dash M Intel. This is telling it what output format of the assembly to, to generate. The Intel versus AT&T. Um, I'm used to the Intel, so I prefer it. Dash D tells it to disassemble all. SO8-SC telling it what file to disassemble. SO9.OBJ dump. Um, I redirect the output to SO9.OBJ dump. And again, I, I label OBJ dump so I know what the output is. So now we can go visit the, uh, or open up an editor, the SO9. First thing you'll notice is it calls the OX, OX8F offset right away. So let's go look at that. We see that it in, immediately does a pop to EBP. So what this is actually doing is it's putting the value of this address, so six, all, uh, into the EBP register. And later on, what we'll notice is this EBP register is used to call. So anytime you call this, we're calling back up to the address of six. This is a very common method used inside Metasploit's payloads. Uh, they'll normally, the first thing you'll see, they, the last thing they push on the hash or on the stack right before the call will be some type of hash. Um, followed by the parameters that will normally go to that. The EBP function will actually take the hash and then try to search the memory of the running process for the library that's loaded and function that matches the hash. Metasploit does the hashing slightly different than the way Windows does it. Um, my, um, Metasploit will actually hash using the name, the, the library name as well as the function name. Windows a lot of times will do the library or library name separate from the function name. There are multiple tools available online to uh, to generate these hash values so that you can look them up pretty quickly. I ended up generating one on my own just so that I had um, an, a grasp and I knew I had a grasp and an understanding of the the methodology or how it worked. So I reverse engineered the the function above. This is what I did I put available is on my GitHub. This is the address to the GitHub account where you can view this. Uh, you have the Python itself there as well as the output that for um, two different uh, libraries. Here's the output that's available. As you can see with this, I broke it up. The very first line will be the kernel32.dll. This is the, uh, again, the, the library that I'm using. This is the normal Windows generated hash for this library. Once after that, we go into the more of the function details. The first one is the ordinal. This is the offset that this function's at. This is the uh, Metasploit hash. This is, again, the hash using the library name and the function name, followed by the function name itself, followed then by the uh, address offset. So going back into the actual shellcode, what we can then do is go through each of these hashes and look them up inside this file. So for the first one, the E553A458, we see that it's a virtual alloc. What I normally do then is, this is one of the reasons why I like using OBJ dump, is that I can just put it in next to the hash. So what we now know is that we're virtual allocating uh, a certain size. That value then is getting pushed onto the stack as um, onto the stack here. Then we call 155, the address 155. First thing this does then is call AD, which happens to be the line directly after the call to 155. Similar to what we talked about when we first, uh, at the very top of this program, where the first instructions basically called and jumped in. This is, by calling it back, it's throwing this value on the stack. And this value, if you notice, is um, ASCII. This is the pipe uh, status under 444 that we saw previously. So if we jumped back to the uh, AD, First thing it does then is, is it pops the EDX. So it's taking that address of the pipe status under 444 and it's storing it into EDX. 
The next hash that we see is the create name pipe. followed by connect name pipe. So generally going through these, what I'll try to do is I'll go through and figure out which of the hashes are and then come back and figure out what the actual uh, shellcode is doing. It tends to make it a little bit more readable. Uh, with something like this, it's fairly small. So you kind of get an idea of what's going on anyways. Um, granted, based off the string that we saw earlier, the uh, um, pipe slash status under 444, and then with the uh, function calls at the top here going create name pipe A and create name pipe or connect name pipe, we're obviously creating and connecting to a pipe and then we're listening for connections. Once the connection is made, we'll read the file in into the, uh, the virtual alloc buffer that we had created earlier. The rest of these are actually just cleaning itself up afterwards. So we'll disconnect the name pipe, close the current handle that has open, and exit the process. Of note right here, offset 151 hex, the jump D word pointer to the ESP plus OX10, this is actually telling it to jump to the buffer that was read into um, where we stored the file. This is allowing execution to pass to whatever second stage shellcode that is pulled down or uploaded to this um, shellcode. That will be allow the attacker to upload any type of uh, next stage they want. It, it could be an interpreter shell. It could also have been just a reverse shell. It could be something more of a loader for uh, more advanced malware. At this point, the analysis stops of this um, shellcode because we don't we don't have a capture of what that second stage was. Uh, that would load directly into memory here and not written to disk, so it was unable to be pulled out. The uh, client at the time did not have a uh, network flow, so we were unable to actually extract from that what was connected at the time and what was sent across. The, uh, as we talked a little bit earlier about this function up top here, how it will actually generate the hash value, um, what the function takes in is it takes the first argument of the hash, it will then uh, cycle through all um, libraries and functions that are currently loaded in memory, hashing those and looking for a hash that matches the first hash that you pass in. It will then pass a jump execution into that address, passing in the rest of the arguments. Uh, this could be going into more detail later on in a separate video. If interest, please leave a comment if you're interested in that, and I can do I can uh, create a video on how to convert this assembly back into just basically code. This concludes uh, today's video. Thank you for uh, joining us. If you have any feedback or suggestions, is there any topics that you want to, uh, me to review or go over, feel free to leave a comment or contact us. Uh, thank you again. Have a good day.